Let's consider the biochemistry of HIV and cholera. So the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is a retrovirus. So what we mean is that this human immunodeficiency virus has got RNA as a genetic material. So that RNA has to be converted to DNA. And that DNA is going to merge with the DNA of the host. And so we call it a retrovirus, right? So this is a basic structure of the HIV virus. So it has got the outside layer or membrane, which is a lipid bilayer, which we call the HIV envelope. So this is actually not its own. It comes from the host cell. So the envelope comes from the host. We are going to see how it is gotten. And then just below the envelope, we have got another layer which we are able to see just below there. We call that as, uh, okay, let me use this one inside in this case for this diagram. It is this one, which we call the capsid. Now, the capsid is the core which is going to contain HIV. Uh, RNA and special enzymes. Now this layer which is just below the envelope, this we are able to see. This one we call it a protein matrix, right? And then inside the capsid we have got the two nucleotides, let me say the two RNA molecules of this <laughs> HIV. And then we have got also enzymes. So we have got three types of enzymes which are found inside here. We have got the transcriptase, the reverse transcriptase. We have got the integrase, and we also have the protease. Now, we need to also to understand more about this structure. Of course, we also have these glycoproteins. These are the ones which are going to be able to attach to the cell membrane receptors so that it is able to penetrate the cell membrane if it goes inside the body. This is again a more at, at least structure that we're able to see deeper structures, which we are not able to see on the previous one. Now, for this one, we can see we first have the envelope, which is the lipid bilayer, the one which is outside. And then we have got these glycoproteins. So glycoprotein, I'm going to just make that short to say GP. So this glycoprotein has got two parts. We have got this one, which is embedded in the cell membrane. This is a transmembrane protein or a, an integral protein because it goes through the cell membrane. So this one, we call it the GP41. GP simply glycoprotein. The 41 is simply representing the weight. So we have got the GP41 and also this one, which is outside, which is the GP120. The GP120 is there to make sure that it binds to the receptors on either the macrophages or the T lymphocytes. And then we have got the GP41, which is embedded in the cell membrane. Inside, we said we have got this layer, which we call the matrix. Okay, the protein matrix, this is the layer which is outside here. Now, the protein matrix is made up of a protein called P17. So P simply says protein, so protein 17. And then we have got the caspid, which is this layer which embeds the two RNA molecules. That is the caspid. The caspid is made up of the protein P24. Okay, P24, that is the caspid. Now, let's know what are the functions of this. We've talked about the P17. The P17 is simply the protein that is found in the matrix. What is its function? So the P17 is just here to make sure that the, uh, it gives the stability and maintain the structure of this virus. So that is the function of the matrix protein P17, right? So we have said we have got the caspid, which is made up of the protein P24. So what is the function? So the caspid is there. It is the one which stores or is the one which embeds the two RNA molecules and also the proteins or let me say the enzymes which are important for the 
HIV virus. Okay. So inside we can see we have got integrase proteins, we have got protease proteins, we have got the RNA trans transcriptase. So this is the structure. Again, we are able to see the same. We have got the envelope made of 120, GP120, that is glycoprotein 120. This is the one which attaches to the receptors on either the macrophage or the T lymphocyte. And then we have got GP41, which is embedded in the envelope. We have got a GAG. So this GAG, the GAG, is simply a group of specific proteins which are important for the structure of the of the uh, virus. So that's the GAG. So these are just the major proteins which are important for maintenance of the structure. So we have got the matrix, which is made up of P17. We already said this is there to maintain the structure. And then we have got another GAG, which is uh, the capside, which is made up of the protein. P20 for the capside is where we find the RNA and also other proteins found inside there. Right. Now let's talk about the life cycle of HIV. So HIV virus is going to first use its GP120 to bind to the receptors on the cell membrane. So these are basically CD4 receptors. Now we have got a CD4 receptor and another receptor, these which we are able to see, we call them core receptors. Now HIV virus is able to attack either the macrophages or the T lymphocyte. Now the core receptors or the macrophages, we call them the CCR5, and then the core receptors of the T cells, we call them the CXCR4. So when that happens, the this GP120 attaches to the CD4 receptors, then this is going to match the cell membrane of the virus is going to merge with the cell membrane of the host and when that happens they're going to fuse the capsid with the enzymes and the RNA is going to be released via endocytosis to the inside of the cell. When the RNA is inside the cell is going to undergo transcript, reverse transcription. We know the central dogma of molecular biology tells us DNA is converted to RNA but since the genetic material of the virus is in forms of RNA, it's going to be converted to DNA by what we call reverse transcriptase. And then when DNA, the viral DNA is formed, it goes into the nucleus and integrates with the DNA of the host. That will be via the enzyme integrase. When that happens, replication is going to happen the DNA is going to make a copy of itself. So now we have got the DNA of the virus and the DNA of the host together. And then it is also going to be released and transcription again is going to happen. RNA is going to again be formed. Proteins are going to be formed, released via exocytosis. So we can see the cell membrane of the host is where the cell membrane or the envelope of the virus actually comes from. That's why we say the envelope of the virus is not its own. And then it's going to bud off and it goes outside like that. Now, there are what we call nucleoside analogs. A nucleoside analog is simply an analog is something that just looks like another. So our DNA is made up of nucleotides, which is made up of a pentose sugar phosphate group and a nitrogenous base. Now, if we don't have the phosphate group, we call that as a nucleoside. Now, nucleoside analogs are simply chemicals or substances which look like nucleosides. So now, because this is a nucleoside, these are used more as medicines to prevent the attachment and also accumulation of the HIV virus. Now, because the, the HIV virus targets DNA. Now, no, DNA is made up of nucleotide, not nucleosides. So these nucleosides are going to undergo phosphorylation to form a nucleotide. If we add a phosphate group to a nucleoside, we form a nucleotide. And then that nucleotide analog is now going to be used to fight these steps, which we have seen 
that the HIV virus is undergoing. So on the first step, when the HIV virus is supposed to attach to the CD4 receptors, we have got these analogs, the binding of fusion inhibitors. So what these do is that they are going to bind to the CD4 receptors to prevent the binding of HIV. And this is going to prevent the accumulation of HIV. Now, if in case it has already bound, it means that the HIV RNA and the proteins are going to be released inside. When they're released inside, what happens is that they are going to undergo reverse transcription. Now, just before they undergo reverse transcription, there are other analogs which are going to inhibit that. We call those reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So these are just there to uh, prevent the conversion of RNA of the virus to DNA. Because if that happens, if it's not converted to DNA, it will not be able to merge with the DNA of the host. Now, if already it has undergone reverse transcription, it is going to go in the nucleus to integrate with the DNA of the host. Another analog, integrase inhibitor. These are going to inhibit the function of the integrase, which makes sure that the, the viral DNA and the host DNA integrate. So these inhibitors do that. Now, in case the DNA of the host and of the virus have already merged, still when they made they are still going to undergo transcription to form again RNA and then translation to form proteins which are also going to come outside. Now the proteins of the enzymes protease are the ones which make sure that they get to form these proteins. So there are also protease inhibitors which are going to prevent the formation and accumulation of these proteins of uh, viral, let me say viral proteins. So all these are the stages at which we are able to use these analog inhibitors to fight the virus. So this is just same explained on this slide. So the life cycle of HIV has got a lot of steps. We have got first the anchoring of HIV to the CD4 cells and then the HIV is going to enter the CD4 cells and then the capside and the nucleus of the, I mean, the capside and the RNA of the virus is going to enter the nucleus. Where they, ent they enter the nucleus, they are going to undergo reverse transcriptase. Okay, the, uh, that is reverse transcription via the enzyme reverse transcriptase. When they undergo reverse transcription, they are going to merge with the DNA of the host that is in integration. After integration, then the new viral material is made that will include also proteins. So we have got what we call the protease. The protease is going to cut and assemble new HIV. So as we saw here, so you have formed again other HIV molecules. Now to make sure that they are functional, this protein protease is there to cleave them, to break them so that they are functional, okay? So at this point, we have got protease inhibitors to prevent the cleavage so that they become non-functional. So this is how this works. All right, let's get to understand also about cholera. Now, cholera is caused by vibro cholerae. So what vibro cholerae does is that it is going to produce a toxin and this toxin is going to activate the enzyme adenylcyclase. Adenylcyclase converts ATP to CAMP, which is cyclic adenosine monophosphate. Now, because we have removed two phosphate groups, then we are going to remain with only one. Okay, so we are going to also have two phosphate groups as products. That is the pyrophosphate. Okay, now we are calling this cyclic adenosine monophosphate because this mono, this phosphate which remains, which is attached at portion number five of the of this sugar, is also going to attach to position number three. So this is the three comma five phosphate attached to the pentose sugar. 
Now, when we form the cyclic adenosine monophosphate, the cyclic adenosine monophosphate has got a lot of functions. One of those functions is that it, invo it is involved in the permeability of the cell membrane to allow the passage of sodium ions, chloride ions, and also water. So when we have got a lot and an increase in cyclic adenosine monophosphate, what is going to happen is that the cell membrane is going to open the chloride channels. And these chloride channels are going to allow the movement of chlorine from the inside. What I mean by inside is, if we are talking about the stomach, we have got the lumen of the stomach, that space which, is, which uh, contains the food when we eat. And then we have got now the inside of the body. So the chloride channels are going to be open and then chlorine, chloride ions are going to be moving to the lumen of the intestines. So when that happens, every time chloride ions are moving, they're going to be attracting water with them. So there's going to be an accumulation of water in the lumen and that is going to cause diarrhea at the end. So that is how cholera causes diarrhea because of the cyclic adenosine monophosphate.